Hello, I'm Jonathan Cross, and you're listening to a series of Boozy and Hawks podcasts marking the 50th anniversary of the death of Igor Stravinsky, one of the 20th century's most important composers. Episode 3, Myth, Faith and Memory. Storytelling lies at the heart of the work of Igor Stravinsky. Taking inspiration from ancient myths and rituals, Russian folklore, stories of the Greeks, primitive and religious ritual practices, Stravinsky remade these tales to speak forcefully of his own age. Petrushka, for instance, half man, half puppet, is an alienated figure of modern times. The primitive sacrifice of the rite of spring uncannily anticipated a world on the brink of catastrophe. Orpheus mourns not just for the loss of his lover Eurydice, but for the losses of so many to war and revolution across the 20th century. Stravinsky's early interest in Russian tales and rituals should hardly surprise us. His nationalism was part of a wider movement among artists in late 19th century St. Petersburg. But with the encouragement of impresario Diaghilev, Stravinsky was able to make these materials suitable for export. Firebird, his first great success, took the fairy tale musical world of Rimsky Korsakov and reconfigured it for an eager Paris audience. Likewise, the scenario design and music of the Rite of Spring was an invention of a pagan Russia rooted in folk culture, certainly, but looking decidedly forwards to a radical modernist future. During the war years spent in Switzerland, cut off from his native land, Stravinsky found solace in telling all sorts of stories, about a Russian soldier and his violin in The Soldier's Tale, about a wily Russian fox disguised as a nun in Renau, and about a Russian wedding in Les Nos. And here's an excerpt from Parasha's aria in Mavra, dating from just after the war, Stravinsky's one-act operatic tribute to his great Russian forebears, Pushkin, Glinka and Tchaikovsky. <laughs> Stravinsky was brought up in the Orthodox faith. He drifted away as a young man, but in the 1920s he returned, in part encouraged by the reconversion to Catholicism of those around him in Paris, most notably Jean Cocteau, and in part because he found himself amidst émigré Russian communities in France. His faith, one might say, was part of sustaining his sense of being Russian in exile. In 1926, while composing Oedipus Rex, he wrote to Diaghilev, I have not been a communicant in 20 years, and it's because of an extreme spiritual need that I'm going to take communion now. The first major artistic statement of his renewal of faith was the Symphony of Psalms, dedicated to the glory of God. It sets the seemingly personal verse, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard me cry. Though the work sets the words of the Latin psalms, there's nonetheless still something strikingly Russian about it, as if it represents the memory of the Russia now lost to him in exile. Stravinsky even claimed that he began work by setting the texts not in Latin, but in ancient Slavonic. The Laudate Dominum of Psalm 150 began as Gospody Pomeloi. Thank you. 
The remainder of Stravinsky's creative life was punctuated by sacred ritual pieces such as the Mass, intended for liturgical use, and the Requiem Canticles, as well as engaging with the Hebrew Old Testament in late pieces such as Abraham and Isaac, Threni, and the Flood. Stravinsky's gradual turn away from explicitly Russian sources in the 1920s and towards classical myth was, one might say, entirely in keeping with his so-called neoclassical turn away from his Russian musical upbringing and towards the music of Western Europe. This was first heard in Paris in the Italianate Pulcinella, and his first work to engage explicitly with Greek mythology was Oedipus Rex, to a text by Cocteau, which also alludes to a range of musical models, including Handel and Gluck, Verdi and Puccini. Later works built on Greek myths include Apollo, Persephone, Orpheus and Agon. These myths gave Stravinsky more than just stories to tell. They helped him to come to terms with who he was, a Russian come Frenchman come American. As Neil McGregor, former director of the British Museum, has written, These are no longer the myths of the Greeks. By now they are ours, and we have made them into the myths we need, the stories through which we seek to understand ourselves. One particular aspect of Stravinsky's ritual pieces are the many memorials he wrote. Indeed, they bookend his creative life. The recently rediscovered funeral song, thought lost for over a century but re-premiered in St. Petersburg in December 2016, is a moving tribute to his teacher Rimsky-Korsakov, whom Stravinsky considered a second father. His final major composition is the Requiem Canticles, commissioned in memory of a Princeton University benefactress and premiered in 1966. However, Vera Stravinsky later claimed that he and we knew he was writing it for himself. And indeed, it was performed at Stravinsky's own funeral just five years later in Venice. In between these works, poignant rituals of lament are dotted across Stravinsky's output, in memory of particular individuals, such as the chorale in Memoriam Debussy that closes the symphonies of wind instruments, or sounded by the weeping of the mythical Orpheus for Eurydice at the start and end of the ballet that bears his name. In later years, Stravinsky wrote a series of memorials for his lost friends and acquaintances, including an elegy for JFK, Variations Aldous Huxley in Memoriam, and the powerful In Memoriam Dallan Thomas, which sets Thomas's famous elegiac poem Do Not Go Gentle into That Good Night. While on the surface Stravinsky's music often appears playful and ironic, there's also a lamenting character that lies behind much of it, bringing a darker colour to so many of his works. I close by returning to Stravinsky's first direct engagement with classical myth and to Oedipus Rex. Here's Jocasta's aria that opens Act Two. It certainly has the monumental air that Stravinsky said he wanted to achieve. Stylistic borrowing from Verdi might also be evident, but it remains unmistakably Stravinsky. Oracula, 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 Oracula,
Leipzig Trivium. <laughs> 